Sam Dunn's all-new podcast, Caught in a Rant. Available now, exclusively on Patreon. Hey everybody, I am Sarah. Welcome back to Overkill Reviews. This is Banger TV's weekly heavy metal review show. <sighs> Coffee, my favorite. Now, before I jump into the review, um, I wanted to share a personal update, which is that my band Smolder, we're about to announce our second studio album. And uh, in the next couple of months, we will be playing festivals in the Czech Republic and Poland and Germany and France, which is super exciting. Now, let's get into the review. This week, I am reviewing the third studio album from the Scottish one man black thrash band, whose previous album I also reviewed for Banger back when it was released in 2020. Now, before we turn on the music video, if you're a person who um, is photosensitive like myself, the video might make you feel a little sick, so just please close your eyes. <laughs> Here it is. All right, that track is called The Knuckle of E, and it is on the new Hell Ripper album, which is called Warlock's Grim and Withered Hags, and it is out today via Peaceville Records. <laughs> <laughs> So, if you're a Banger fan, you might have seen my previous review on Hellripper's album where I hyper-contextualize the Black Thrash scene and sound that Hellripper emerges from. And if you'd like to see that video, the link is in the bio description. Uh, if you're not into homework, that's totally fine. Here's the Cliff Notes version. Um, Hellripper formed in 2014 in Aberdeen, Scotland, and they are helmed by multi-instrumentalists and vocalists James McBain. On their first two studio albums, they created strong examples of the Black Thrash genre, but they didn't really offer much variation on the theme. Whereas this third studio album is being pitched as uh, McBain's most diverse and personal record to date. Does this record achieve that goal? Let's find out. Okay. So to reiterate, uh, the emphasis on this record is both on sonic diversity and on being a personal work. So we're going to talk about the sonic diversity, which you're going to notice on the very first track, which is the knuckle of e. um, That already diverges from the black thrash speed template in the latter half of the song when it really kicks into the 90s style shrieking melodic black metal quite high gear. Uh, that very black metal energy then continues into the second track, which is called I Deceiver, which is surprisingly aggressive, and it ends with a very, or it has a very enticing hook, and it ends with that classic Celtic Frost, ooh, which is black thrash. <laughs> After a handful of full album listens, you may also notice that the songs tend to start slower and end faster, which is super evident on the track The Cursed Carrion Crown, which has this robustly black metal vibe, which becomes explosive and very fast near the end. We're going to listen to it. Let's go. Right after that, we are treated to the song called The Hissing Marshes, which kicks off with a very Motorhead-esque riff. So obviously this entire record is not just in the black metal camp, but wow, the shift towards the blacker and more melodic side of black thrash throughout this album is very uh, pronounced. And in addition, the songs are much longer. So in the previous two albums, the track lengths max, max out at four minutes and 56 seconds per track. Whereas on this album, we get songs as long as eight minutes and 32 seconds. And that's a lot more space to build atmosphere and to play with dynamics. All right, point two, which is the personalized lyrical focus. I know that Black Thresh is generally about evil, 
death, black magic, Satan, anti-Christianity. But it's cool to hear McBain go more into mythology as that previous lyrical focus has been extensively covered. And it's not like those topics are not rife in mythology anyway. So it's a very natural pairing. Uh, if you're a lyrical person, which I absolutely am, it was cool to um, dive into a Wikipedia rabbit hole to learn more about the Scottish mythology themes, which included uh, references to characters, or I should say monsters, like the Knuckle of E, the Store Worm, and I think the Spunky. I like lyrics that make you learn and uh, teach you something about really anything. <laughs> it's fun. All right, we're going to combine point one and point two into point three. Uh, on the album's title track, which is called Warlock's Grim and Withers, Withered Hags, you're going to hear even more experimentation and pure, the personal uh, lyrical focus combined in that a bagpipe makes an appearance on uh, Hellripper's music for the very first time. Starting off with this lengthy instrumental passage that feels jaunty in how the riffs and the drums are continually uh, propelling along, it then eventually leads into a gang chanting section where the layered backing vocalists are all shouting warlocks while McBain shrieks the verses. And the verses and the song itself are a reinterpretation of Scottish poet Robert Burns' humorous poem, which is called Address to the Devil, which was published in 1786. This version reimagines nature as the devil's church and the musical accompaniment is quite diverse. Later on, the speed slows down as the drums become almost militaristic before the guitars shift into blazing solos. All told, there's a lot of halting progressions that then return to the central chorus, and that works well, particularly when the bagpipes take over and repeat that musical progression until almost the track end. Let's check that out. I like this song. It's got a strong progression. It explores. It's fun. It's a big win, and it's likely the best song on the album, although it's competing with the closing track for that title. I think most of the people who are watching will probably already know the drill. Um, I tend to listen to albums between 10 and 15 times before I write a review, and I think it's really easy for and common for album reviewers and music journalists in general to be super hy hyperbolic about albums that they've only listened to a handful of times. And on that note, all the reviews that I've read so far about this album are absolutely raving about how game-changing, bar-raising, and exceptional that it is. But an album's true power comes from actually repeatedly listening to it. Can you listen to an album 10 times? Can you do it 25, 250 times, 1,000 times? Uh, and that's where uh, I struggled. I... Don't know if it was the circumstances that I was listening to this record in, but I didn't find myself wanting to listen to this album over and over. Um, and I found myself actually accidentally switching over when I wasn't really paying attention to a different record. And I went back and thought about how many times I had listened to uh, the previous Hell Ripper record since I reviewed it. And that number was lower than I thought it would be. Um, so yeah, I'm not yet convinced that it's an essential pur purchase, although things like that extremely hooky riff in the song Goat Vomit Nightmare or the experimentation slash bagpipe edition and like the guest vocalist, all that might change my mind with time. And that brings me to my last point. So I don't need to tell all of you this. Artwork is pretty vital for heavy metal. And for that reason, I think that Hellripper's shift over to renowned cover artist Adam Burke was a really good call for this record because it does show and sound like Hellripper is breaking out of their, you know, Black Thrash shell. The artwork for the last album, it's well made, don't get me wrong, but it's more direct and it's more confrontational, whereas the artwork for this record has a more mystical vibe that communicates the further lyrical dive into Scottish folklore. 
of course, the artwork for uh, the Hell Ripper debut, Coagulating Darkness, was even more primitive than the second and third album. And I think you can both see and hear an evolution in this discography, which is in line with the musical progress. So that is definitely a good call. All right, so this was the first album in a while that I actually really struggled to come up with a uh, rating for because I did like the last album, um, but I didn't listen to it very much after it was released. Um, and I'm trying to think about that more seriously and critically for my current reviews. So because I really did enjoy listening to this record, but I didn't want to do it that many times, I'm going to be giving this album three and a half skulls out of five here on Overkill Reviews. What did you think? I assume that there's going to be a lot of Hell Ripper fans who say they really like it because it is a very strong record. Leave a comment, debate, be civil. If you're a fan of this type of musical analysis, then be sure to check us out on Twitch or Patreon. Also, Sam Dunn has a new podcast, so more banger content, I guess. <laughs> All right, so now it's time for my favorite part of the review, which is the shout outs. And I've got two killer shout outs for you. Uh, the first shout out is to Finnish Occult Doom Band Mansion, who just released their second album called Second Death. And this is gonna be on my best albums of the year list without question. It sounds like Italian occult horror doom a la Goblin, merged with Hands of Orlock, but lyrically this focuses on the Finnish Christian cult called Cartonism, who were infamous for child preachers and other such abuses. While I wasn't into Mansion's debut, I really think that they stepped it up with album two. It was certainly worth the wait. Second up, I've got another Finnish pick, but I live in Finland now, so you know, getting into that local scene, which is, or into the local scene, which is fantastic. Um, this one is a bit of a bias pick because uh, their drummer, Valtteri, has joined the Finnish version of Smolder, but it's because he's an incredibly talented drummer. Uh, without further ado, I would like to shout out to the debut EP by Finnish death metalers Ashen Tomb. It calls to mind acts like Aberrants, and uh, it's out now on Bandcamp. Tuo seon, hyvä päivän jatkoa, hei hei, nachtan miehimen. Bye.